guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History. And today is our next Vice Presidential Series installment. And we're taking a look at the 11th Vice President of the United States, George Mifflin Dallas. Yeah, I am here in Philadelphia at George Mifflin Dallas gravesite. This is it right here. We're gonna tell you all about George Mifflin Dallas, of course. But first, what I need you to do is hit subscribe down below Give us a like and a thumbs up. Leave all those comments and questions. And of course, hit that little notification bell so you can be notified when we release a new video, which is, if Henry was here, he would tell you, every single week. So now sit back and relax, because here we go. Our next Vice Presidential Series installment, taking a look at George Mifflin Dallas. And this is Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you. Yep. And I'm here at the St. Peter's Episcopal Churchyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I'm at the 11th Vice President of the United States gravesite, George Mifflin Dallas. Got some cool things to tell you about George Mifflin Dallas. Of course, this is his gravesite. He was from Philadelphia, so pretty cool stuff. He's buried here along with his wife, Sophia. We're gonna get into all that and tell you all about it. Some other cool things about George Mifflin Dallas. He was the 11th vice president under James K. Polk. And after his vice presidency, both the cities of Dallas, Texas and Dallas, Oregon were named after George Mifflin Dallas. Some cool things. All right, so you did the likes, you did the subscribes. Hopefully you're leaving those comments and questions. Now what I need you to do, if Henry was here, he would tell you, go get the popcorn, go get the potato chips, the pretzels, the soda. Whatever you like to snack on, because it's time for our next Vice Presidential Series installment, taking a look at the 11th Vice President of the United States, George Mifflin Dallas. This is going to be a good one. Looking forward to it. So here we go. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here with Mr. Henry. Hello! And today, we're going to be talking about our 11th Vice President of the United States. Henry, do you have any idea who that is? Do you, do you remember who I told you we're doing or no? No. Uh, George Mifflin. No clue. Okay, I'll give you a hint. I told you that there's a big city in Texas named after him. Wow. And you even asked me, you said, is the blank Texas named after him? Um, da Dallas. Texas. There you go. That's his last name, George Mifflin Dallas. And yes, Dallas, Texas, and Dallas, Oregon, both those cities are named after this guy. Pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, Henry's here. He's just saying hi, right? Yep. Uh, and I'm going to be doing the audio on my own, but Henry wanted to say hi real quick. Uh, Henry's actually off from school this week for New Jersey teachers conventions and all that good stuff that they do in early November every year. Uh, they didn't do it last year because of COVID, so Henry's very happy, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have a week off, right? Yes. So, all right, guys. Well, um, we're going to get right into it here. Uh, I'm going to take over the audio on my own. Henry, say bye to the people. Bye. And tell them uh, you'll be back next week in our video, our, our intro, right? Yes. All right. Well, bye from Henry. Bye-bye. And I will be right back to start off this next Vice Presidential Series. Hey, guys. TJ here with Dead History. Uh, you just heard our little introduction there with Henry, of course. And welcome. Welcome to our next Vice Presidential Series installment and as Henry and I just told you, we're taking a look at the 11th Vice President of the United States, George Mifflin Dallas. So uh, we're going to get right into it here. Of course, uh, we're doing George Mifflin Dallas because some people say, well, wait a minute. We went from Richard Mentor Johnson to George Mifflin Dallas. Well, what happened to John Tyler? He's actually next. He's number 10. Yes, he is. But as I've said... We are not doing any vice presidents that later became president because we've already done a uh, video on those people. So 
If you want to see our John Tyler video, go over to uh, our videos uh, page. Go to the Presidential Series um, little playlist and take a look. Uh, our John Tyler video is in there if you would like to see. So, here we go. George Mifflin Dallas. George Mifflin Dallas admitted in his later years that his driving force in life was for historical fame. From the 1840s on, through the latter part of the 19th century, Americans associated his name with the acquisition of Texas and the settlement of the Oregon boundary dispute. Texas memorialized his contributions to the state's history by renaming the town of Peter's Corner in his honor. In the 1850s, when officials in Oregon sought a name for the principal town in Polk County, they settled on the logical choice, Polk's vice president. Thus, while largely forgotten today as the nation's 11th vice president, George Mifflin Dallas has won his measure of immortality in a large Texas city and a small Oregon town. For four years at the heart of the Senate's most tumultuous era, Vice President George Dallas occupied a center stage seat in the nation's premier political theater. This courtly Philadelphia aristocrat, whose political ambition greatly exceeded his political energy, entered that arena in 1845 filled with optimism for the nation, the Democratic Party, and his own presidential future. He departed in 1849 embittered and depressed, his political chances obliterated. During his term, the nation fought and won a war with Mexico, acquired vast new territories, settled a chronic northwestern boundary dispute, discovered gold, and launched a communications revolution with the invention of the telegraph. In the Senate, where political party caucuses assumed new powers to appoint committee members and distribute patronage, the central debates occurred over the status of slavery in the territories and the very nature of the Constitutional Union. With increasing frequency, Senators faced conflicting choices between the desires of their parties and of their constituencies. When such an unavoidable decision confronted Vice President Dallas in July of 1846 on the then searing issue of tariff policy, he chose party over constituency, thereby forfeiting his political future. George Mifflin Dallas was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on July 10th of 1792, the second of Alexander and Arabella Smith Dallas's six children. Alexander Dallas, a politically well-connected Philadelphia lawyer, served as secretary for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and reporter for the opinions of the U.S. Supreme Court and other courts then meeting in that city which was, at the time, the nation's capital and leading commercial center. In 1801, as a reward for the elder Dallas's assistance in his presidential election campaign, Thomas Jefferson appointed him U.S. District Attorney for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. He remained in that post until 1814, when President James Madison selected him as his Treasury Secretary. In 1815, Alexander Dallas also served concurrently for a brief period as Acting Secretary of War. He then resigned the Treasury position in 1816 to return to his law practice with the intention of expanding the family's financial resources. However, early the following year, a chronic illness led to his death at the age of 59, leaving his family without the wealth necessary to support its accustomed style of living. George Mifflin Dallas graduated with highest honors from the College of New Jersey at Princeton in 1810. Yeah, 
He's got some New Jersey ties. He then studied law, and in 1813, at the age of 20, he was admitted to the Pennsylvania Bar. With little taste for legal practice, he sought military service in the War of 1812, but abandoned those plans on the objection of his ever-influential father. He then readily accepted an appointment to serve as private secretary to former Treasury Secretary and Pennsylvania political figure Albert Gallatin, who was about to embark on a wartime mission to secure the aid of Russia in U.S. peace negotiations with Great Britain. Dallas enjoyed the opportunities that travel to this distant land offered, but after six months, orders took him from St. Petersburg to London to probe for diplomatic openings that might bring the war to an end. In August of 1814, as British troops were setting fire to the U.S. Capitol, young Dallas carried a preliminary draft of Britain's peace terms home to Washington and accepted President Madison's appointment as remitter of the Treasury, a convenient arrangement at a time when his father was serving as that department's secretary. The light duties of his new post left Dallas plenty of time to pursue his major vocational interest, politics. In 1816, lonely and lovesick, Dallas left Washington for Philadelphia, where he married Sophia Chu Nicklin, daughter of an old-line Federalist family. They would eventually have eight children. His marriage extended his social and political reach, but as his modern biographer reports, prestige came without money, a circumstance that was doubly unfortunate because he had developed extravagant tastes as a youth. For this reason, he continually lived beyond his means and was constantly in debt, a situation that caused him on more than one occasion to reject otherwise acceptable political posts. At the start of his married life, Dallas achieved a measure of financial stability by accepting a position as counsel to the Second Bank of the United States, an institution his father had helped create while Treasury Secretary. The 1817 death of Alexander Dallas, his father, abruptly ended George's plans for a family law practice. He left the Bank of the United States to become Deputy Attorney General of Philadelphia, a post he held until 1820. George Mifflin Dallas cultivated a bearing appropriate to his aristocratic origins. Tall, with soft hazel eyes, an aquiline nose, and sandy hair, he dressed impeccably in the finest clothes his fashionable city could offer. He wrote poetry, and when the occasion warranted, he spoke perfectly nuanced French. He developed an oratorical style that capitalized on his sonorous voice and protected him from the barbs of quicker-witted legal adversaries. His biographer explains that, whether by chance or design, his habit of talking slowly and emphasizing each word created the feeling that he was reasoning his way to a conclusion on the spot. Since he also prepared cases carefully in advance, his apparent groping for the right word and finding it reinforced the initial impression that a great mind was at work. Dallas, however, lacked both the intense drive necessary to achieve his high ambitions and a natural politician's gift for warm social interaction with those outside his immediate circle. A silk-stocking Jeffersonian in an age of egalitarianism, Tarianism. He preferred to remain aloof from the rough and tumble world of political deal making. Only once in his public life, when he ran for the vice presidency, did he submit himself to the decision of the voting public. The Pennsylvania State Legislature awarded him his Senate term, and the rest of his offices were given by appointment. At crucial moments, Dallas pulled back from the wrenching political compromises and exhausting coalition building necessary to achieve his lifelong quest for the presidency. 
So I'm going to read a little bit more, uh, just kind of what I was speaking about, about his family. So George Mifflin Dallas was born on July 10th of 1792 to Alexander James Dallas and Arabella Maria Smith Dallas, who was born in Devon, England, by the way. So his mom, Arabella, she was born in Devon, England. I'm sure you know where that is, Les. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, definitely want a big shout out to Les, one of our subscribers who's over there in the UK. Uh, wherever Devon, England is, uh, that's where George Dallas's mom was born. Uh, so George Dallas was born in Philadelphia. His father, believe it or not, was born in Kingston, Jamaica to Dr. Robert Dallas and educated in Edinburgh, was the Secretary of the Treasury under United States President James Madison and was also briefly the Secretary of War. Or Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh. Apologize if I mispronounced. Dr. Dallas, his, so his grandfather this is, left Jamaica in 1764 having mortgaged his estate, Dallas Castle, and put it in a trust. This property included 900 acres and 91 slaves. George Dallas was given his middle name after Thomas Mifflin, another politician who was good friends with his father. George Dallas was the second of six children, another of whom, Alexander, would become the commander of the Pensacola Navy Yard. During Dallas's childhood, the family lived in a mansion on 4th Street with a second home in the countryside situated on the Skullkill River, or Skullkill River. He was educated privately at Quaker Run Preparatory Schools before studying at the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton University, from which he graduated with highest honors in 1810. While at college, he participated in several activities, including the American Whig Cluosophic, 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 Society. No idea what that is. Sounds like a Whig party type thing. Afterwards, he studied law in his father's office and he was admitted to the bar in 1813. Um, we knew as a new graduate, Dallas had little enthusiasm for legal practice. He wanted to fight in the War of 1812, a plan that he dropped due to his, due to his father's objection. We know what he did, and then he was obviously working for the Second Bank of the United States. Uh, we know all that. Um, okay, so now let's move on to the very interesting uh, feud and rivalry he had with James Buchanan. Let's take a look. Pennsylvania's chaotic political climate in the 40 years that followed the War of 1812 promoted, shaped, and ultimately sidetracked Dallas's public career. Two factions within the state's Democratic Party contended for power during that time. Led by Dallas, the Philadelphia-based Family Party shared his belief in the supremacy of the Constitution and in an active national government that would impose protective tariffs, operate a strong central banking system, and promote so-called internal improvements to facilitate national commerce. In factional opposition to Dallas, stood the equally patrician James Buchanan of Harrisburg, head of the rival Amalgamators. Yeah, Amalgamators. Whose strength lay among the farmers of western Pennsylvania. When the family party gained control of the Philadelphia City Councils, its members in 1828 elected Dallas as mayor. Boredom with that post quickly led Dallas in his father's path to the position of district attorney for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, where he stayed from 1829 to 1831. In December of 1831, he won a five-man, 11-ballot contest in the state legislature for election to the U.S. Senate to complete an, an unexpired term. In the Senate, for only 14 months, he chaired the Naval Affairs Committee and supported President Andrew Jackson's views on protective tariffs and the use of force to implement federal tariff laws in South Carolina. A longtime supporter and financial beneficiary of the Second Bank of the United States, 
whose original charter his father had drafted, Dallas reluctantly parted company with the president on the volcanic issue of the bank's rechartering. As one Dallas biographer has written, there was no question about how the people of Pennsylvania viewed the Second Bank of the United States. The Philadelphia-based institution was Pennsylvanian by interest, location, and legislative initiative. Dallas complied with a directive from his state legislature that he support a new charter, despite Jackson's unremitting opposition and his own view that the device of recharter issue should be put off until after the 1832 presidential election. When Jackson vetoed the Recharter Act in July of 1831 and Congress failed to override the veto, Dallas, always the pragmatist, dropped his support for the bank. Observing that we ought to have it, but we can do without it. He mollified the president and angered his state's influential commercial interests. Dallas realized that his chances for re-election to the Senate by the state legislature were uncertain. His wife, Sophia, who refused to leave Philadelphia's comforts for muddy and cholera-ridden Washington, was growing increasingly bitter over the legislative and social demands of his life in the Capitol. Consequently, Dallas chose not to run for a full term, and he left the Senate in March of 1833. Although off the national stage, Dallas remained active in state Democratic politics. The tension with Buchanan intensified when the latter returned from his diplomatic post in Russia and secured Pennsylvania's other seat in the U.S. Senate. Dallas turned down opportunities to return to the Senate and to become the nation's Attorney General. Instead, he accepted an appointment as State Attorney General holding that post until 1835, when control of the state's party machinery shifted from the declining family party to Buchanan's amalgamators. In 1837, it was Dallas's turn for political exile as newly elected President Martin Van Buren named him U.S. Minister to Russia. Although Dallas enjoyed the social responsibilities of that post, he soon grew frustrated at its lack of substantive, substantive duties and returned to the United States in 1839. He found that during his absence in St. Petersburg, Buchanan had achieved a commanding position in the home state political contest that had long engaged the two men. In December of 1839, Van Buren offered the U.S. Attorney General position to Dallas after Buchanan had rejected the post. Dallas again declined the offer and spent the following years building his Philadelphia law practice. His relations with Buchanan remained troubled throughout this period. So pretty interesting stuff. Him and James Buchanan kind of, you know, were at odds and didn't really see eye to eye or like each other. Kind of, kind of interesting there. So believe it or not, guys, that actually leads us right up to the uh, campaign and the election of 1844. And then, of course, uh, George Mifflin Dallas's vice presidency and him as president of the Senate and such. Um, I know this was a short part one. Part two will be longer. It won't be real long. It'll probably be, you know, in the 40, 45 minute range. But um, part one, this is pretty much all we could go over. Uh, part two will be longer, like I said, tomorrow. Uh, I don't, I'll be honest with you guys too. There is outside of, in part two, at the end of part two, I did uh, go down to Philadelphia and I took some video uh, at George Mifflin Dallas's grave site. So you'll see that stuff as bonus footage at the end of part two. Um, but there's no bonus footage for part one because to be completely honest with you, there is very, very little information out there on George Mifflin Dallas. Uh, I even tried to find, I looked it up and I tried to find if I could find like an address 
of where he lived in Philadelphia or, or maybe where his law office was in Philadelphia. Even if the building doesn't stand any longer, I could still get a you know, general proximity and idea. And I would have went there and took some video and pictures and showed you guys, but there's nothing. Um, like I said, I'm sure if I really dig super, super deep, I might find something like that, but just on the surface, uh, you know, and I, I do pretty thorough, um, you know, research with this stuff, of course, sometimes very, very thorough. I couldn't find anything. Uh, so very little information about George Mifflin Dallas, but the information I have, I'm going to bring to you, of course. So that's it for part one, guys. That's the early life and kind of political life, and then the rise all the way up to the 1844 campaign and election. And tomorrow, we'll get into that 1844 election and George Mifflin Dallas's vice presidency and his time in as the president of the Senate and the, uh, the whole uh, uh, thing about uh, the annexation of Texas and Texas and westward expansion and all this kind of stuff. So we're going to get into that tomorrow. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by and watching. Uh, of course, stay tuned. Tomorrow, part two. Uh, I, thank you. Me and Henry, thank you guys so much. You know, like I said, we took our two-week break. It was nice to refresh. Um, I think a lot of you really enjoyed last week, Richard Mentor Johnson and my interview with Dr. Myers about her book. I thought myself personally, I thought that was fascinating. So I hope you guys did as well. Um, and I hope all these videos are good and fascinating for you guys. Even, you know, ones like this where I don't have a lot of information. Like I said, I'm going to deliver as much as I possibly can for you guys to at least give you an overview of who this 11th vice president was. So thanks guys. Keep up all the support. Really appreciate it. Can't thank you enough. Uh, you know, leave those comments and questions. I love the comments. I love the questions. Had a question from, uh, I believe it was Matt. Uh, he asked me if I've ever experienced any like paranormal, you know, experiences, all these cemeteries and stuff I go to anything. I love that stuff. Like ask me anything you want. I'd be more than happy to answer it for you. So keep all that stuff coming. Thanks guys. Hope you enjoyed part one. See you tomorrow for part two. Bye bye now.